My lords, I have some concerns um, of the changes being made in the defamation laws, <clears throat> and I feel that they are too lenient and to the advantage of the printed media, the, the national press. I, I've listened very carefully to <coughs> Viscount Coville, who has quite rightly um, stated that we should not be here suppressing freedom of speech and that responsible media owners um, are being attacked by frivolous and derisory claims. But I'm afraid to say that laws that are drafted and crafted uh, with responsible uh, members of the media, like the BBC in mind, are abused by the biggest culprits that cause the problems in the marketplace. Now, I speak as a past claimant who has taken the media to court on numerous occasions, and whilst I won't go into the details at the moment, what I can say is that being a detailed person myself, uh, I became deeply involved in the legal procedures and feel that I'm somewhat of an expert, um, albeit I, I'm not a lawyer, but I now have a good understanding of the laws of defamation. Uh, more to the point, on the tricks of the trade played by the media in interpreting and using the law for their benefit. It is at this juncture, my lords, that I think it is useful for me to remind your lordship there is one thing, and one thing alone, that is of prime importance to the media, and that is money, and how much it will affect their pocket. The days of the Elton John million pound awards have long gone, and nowadays judges advise juries on libel damages by making comparison with damages receivable say, for, say, a broken ankle or a broken leg, the loss of sight in one eye. I, I say this is flawed. Those comparable damages are most probably the result of an accident. There is no accident in printing lies. We now see the top end of damages people receive for libel in the region of 100,000 to 150,000 pounds. And I understand the current proposal is that damages for personal injuries, and therefore libel damages, are to be increased by approximately 10%. I will go on to explain why this is still inadequate. Most people, particularly some minor celebrities and more to the point, politicians, cannot afford to fund a fully-fledged defamation case. And up until recently, it has been possible for lawyers to take on those cases completely free to the claimant. And if they succeed, the lawyer is entitled to charge the claimant up to double his normal fee, and the claimant would then be able to claim this double fee from the defendant together with the cost procuring an insurance policy to cover the case in the event that the claimant lost. Now I'm advised this is all being discarded uh, and that's no longer be possible, but instead from approximately 2013 we will have a situation whereby lawyers will be able to take on cases on a contingency basis. Well, my lords, I think you have to look at the ramifications of this. Why would a lawyer with all due respect to lawyers, take on uh, a case on a contingency basis when the ultimate goal for the claimant may be in the region of £150,000. The lawyer's share of that would not make up for the fact that the lawyer, when doing the case on a contingency basis, is therefore risking not being paid at all if their client lost. And from the claimant's perspective, any damages they do receive would be eaten up by the contingency fee and the shortfall in costs between the actual costs and those costs that uh, they are awarded from the defendant to pay. I, I, I believe this is a non-starter. And what we will have arrived back at is a situation whereby only the rich, such as I, can afford to take on the media, while others have to be beaten up and can do nothing about it. I would also ask your Lordships to consider another commercial aspect of the media printing untrue stories. 
If a newspaper decides deliberately to print a pack of lies on its front page to attract more readers at the point of sale, your lordship should understand that this is a much cheaper way of boosting a paper's circulation than by engaging in an expensive television advertising campaign. And why is it much cheaper? Because the media can immediately agree in communication that what they wrote was wrong and addend that with, say, a Part 36 offer of £50,000, thus throwing the gauntlet down to the claimant as to whether they wish to risk going to court. A very cheap way of dealing with things, and I'm sure you'll agree with no or very little apology required. And apologies, in any case, as my Lordships know, are usually postage stamp size. They're not on the same page as the offending article. In most cases, they're buried towards the middle of the newspaper without so much as a picture of the offended claimant. This apology matter has to be addressed, and the noble Lord Malwini has, has, has raised it here, quite rightly so. I think a newspaper must be forced by the courts to print a retraction or apology on the same page as the offending item appeared, and with the same prominence. And this, together with higher damages, will make them wake up and act far more responsibly. Now, on a technical front, whereas in the past <clears throat> the claim of fair comment in an article had to be supported by facts within that article, I'm advised that this has changed, or the there is a proposal that it's going to change. <clears throat> um, and, and those proposals are going to be embodied in the bill so that the facts supporting allegations made in an article do not have to appear in the article itself, but just have to be facts that existed at the time an article was written. The writer doesn't even have to show that the readers of the article in question would have had to know those facts. As, an, as a maybe stupid but extreme example, a journalist might write an article say that it is, in his opinion a particular person was a thief and a thoroughly untrustworthy individual without referring to any facts to support that in the article. And if challenged in court, he might say that the person he wrote about, say a middle-aged man, once stole a Mars bar from a sweet shop when he was seven. Well, the statement doesn't have to be a reasonable one or even one a reasonable man could have held. It just has to be that person's honestly held opinion, however bigoted. And I'm further advised that the responsible journalism defence, also known as the Reynolds defence, is now being modified. Now these days, when, when a journalist phones me up with an allegation of something or other, I say, sorry, old chap, you're wrong, and I'm not prepared to comment. I don't see why I should become your editor of an article which you wish to produce. Why should the onus be on the claimant to go into detail as to why an article should not be published or why the article is inaccurate, presenting all the facts to the journalist in order to be able to rely upon that statement at a later stage should the matter go to court? But as I understand it, if I don't do that now, I'm at risk of the journalist subsequently relying on the responsible journalism defence, saying, I did seek his comments, but he didn't tell me why. He didn't tell me what I was writing about him was wrong. I don't think that's fair, my lords. I think that my method is very fair. I'm not your editor. <clears throat> I've told you that what you're about to print is wrong, and it is at your risk that you go ahead and publish it, and in the meantime, I will reserve my rights. That's how it should be. After all, I didn't ask him to write anything about me. I would like to conclude, however, on a, a, a more of an upbeat thing. It's not all doom and gloom. Uh, I do implore the fact that uh, many cases may be heard now without a jury. And I would support this completely because in the past I'm afraid to say that claimants who are not used to being in a witness box have been badgered by smart, smart lawyers and made them, to look, made them to either look stupid or to make them look like liars. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Another important aspect is that jurors often cannot follow the finer legal points being raised by both parties and sometimes come to their verdicts based upon their opinions of the individual who is bringing the action. In other words, their personal thoughts on the individual, whether they like the claimant or as a person or what they stand for in public life. That is clearly not fair and I welcome the fact that a judge who can see through the badgering of a witness will ultimately decide on the verdict, on the facts and on the law. And I would ask the Minister to take into consideration the points that I have raised. Yeah. Mm.